these camps remain a huge problem. They've mm. got uh, 55 different nationalities in the camps, Europeans, Africans, Syrians, Iraqis, Asians. Some countries have repatriated their women and children. Some are in the process of that. Many haven't. Long term, they're a big security problem. Uh, it doesn't actually do much to defuse radicalization. It's kettling a lot of people together. And it's exposing a lot of children, many of whom had absolutely no choice in ending up in Syria in the first place, some of whom have been born in the camps and never known anything else, exposing them to a lot of, um, you know, it's not just radical strange thought, it's strains of thought, it's, it's violence and, and detention as well. Hello, Hugo Rifkin here on Times Radio, just gone 20 past 11. Now, the Times' special correspondent Anthony Lloyd has had a, a series of fascinating pieces on Syria in the paper this week, which you can check out with your digital subscription at thetimes.co.uk and there are more dispatches from Anthony to come over the Easter weekend. He has been reporting from the detention camps uh, within which there are some bleak stories and fomenting support for a re-emerging ISIS. Uh, Anthony Lloyd, welcome to the programme. Hugo, good morning. Uh, what a pleasure to speak to you. Look, you've got a, from our correspondent piece coming out uh, about the sort of bleak outlook both for and of the women in these detention camps. Tell us a bit about these camps and who's in them at the moment. Hugo, certainly. So there's, there's two main camps in northeastern Syria. This is an area of ground, about 25% of the whole country, that's controlled by the SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces, which are Kurdish-led and supported by the US coalition. Now, the camps that are in the in this area, there's two main ones, there's Al Hol and Roj Camp. These were existing refugee camps before 2019. In 2019, the small refugee populations in each were supplemented by Islamic State affiliated families that were fleeing the collapse of the last territorial entity of the Caliphate. There's a huge battle at town of Baguz in 2019, concluded in March 2019. The SDF won, were victorious against Islamic State. But on the back of that, you had scores and scores of thousands of predominantly women and children, mm. ISIS-affiliated, coming out of Baguz. Uh, most of them were put in our hole, um, and it peaked our hole's population, I think at one point about 60,000, it's less than that now. And the other camp, it's 42,000 now, of whom 30,000 are less than 18 years old. Wow. And the other camp is, is Roj Camp, which has got about 2,500, 2,600 people in, of whom 1,600 are less than 18 years old. So most of this camp population are women and children. Most were Islamic State affiliated. Some ended up living in the Caliphate through no fault of their own. But these camps remain a huge problem. They've mm. got... Uh, 55 different nationalities in the camps, Europeans, Africans, Syrians, Iraqis, Asians. Some countries have repatriated their women and children. Some are in the process of that. Many haven't. Long term, they're a big security problem. Uh, it doesn't actually do much to defuse radicalization. It's kettling a lot of people together. And it's exposing a lot of children, many of whom had absolutely no choice in ending up in Syria in the first place, some of whom have been born in the camps and never known anything else, exposing them to a lot of, um, you know, it's not just radical strange thought, it's strains of thought, it's, it's violence and, and detention as well. You can be... Be, but from the cradle to the grave, you can you can be born, live and die in a detention camp without having made any decision of your own life at all. This is a similar sort of camp to, 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 to where you discovered Shamima, Shamima Begum, I, I, I presume. I actually, yeah, I discovered Shamima Begum in our whole camp right. in yeah. February 2019, just before the conclusion of the battle. She's no longer there. She's in Roger Camp. And look, I mean, what sort of hope do, the, do, do the, the many women in these camps have for the future? What do they envisage? What's possible that can make their life better beyond the camp becoming slightly nicer? Because presumably the idea of them being reintegrated, I mean, in, well, into, into Syrian society or any society seems like a, a fairly distant dream for most of them. So it depends. Their aspirations depend on, on their nationality and whether there is any hope largely of being, you know, repatriated. And for some, for example, if you're, you know, from the Netherlands in one of these camps, you might have a very strong hope of being repatriated. Uh, France, the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany have led, amongst European nations, have led repatriation efforts. And since 2019, for example, those four countries have repatriated 113 women and mm. about 320 kids. Others, including Britain, have done far less than that. Britain's 
officially repatriated two women and about 10 children. Unofficially, that number might be a tiny bit bigger, but by and large, Britain is saying, no, take away your citizenship and you're not coming back. Mm. Now, if you're Syrian or Iraqi, then you do not really want to be repatriated. A lot of these Syrian women will come from regime areas and, you know, the thought of repatriation means either long-term in prison or death for them. Um, and very interestingly, I went to the actual protection wing in our whole camp. This is where families who are Islamic State affiliated but have been either threatened or attacked for a variety of reasons go. And one of the uh, women I was speaking to there, I mean, she wasn't alone in having no vision of a future outside the camps. I mean, I spoke to her uh, about what she hoped for in life and she just said, I hope to be moved to a better camp. And her story was, was again, not uncommon. She was 20 years old. She was called Rana. She was from Idlib originally, so Syrian. She had been, came from an Islamic State family, married off to a Tunisian fighter when she was 13 years old. Her uh, husband was killed. She'd had three kids with him. They'd all died uh, as infants. Her parents were dead. She had one brother, Islamic State memory, member, who'd been put in prison in Hasaga and killed during a breakout. So she had nobody left at all. She'd been shot in the face and twice in the shoulder while detained in our whole camp oh by um, Islamic State members because they'd accused her of a pregnancy out of wedlock. She said that um, she wasn't married and the baby wasn't her. She was looking at, after this child of another woman who'd had a baby. Uh, and Islamic State cells still exist, more than exist, flourish indeed, in our whole, which is now, as I say, 42,000 people, including some males. And that was kind of... Islamic State's presence was epitomised for me by uh, the fact that in January this year, an Islamic State emir, this kind of high-ranking commander, uh, blew himself up the suicide belt inside the camp, mm. having infiltrated the camp two years previously. So for two years, you've had an Islamic State emir inside the Syrian section of the camp. Kurdish security forces consistently trying to hunt him down, always failing. Finally, they did uh, corner him in January and he blew himself up. It's been 180 murders in our whole camp since 2019. Um, and so really feral, feral place better controlled than it was, but still really bleak. And you get a lot of people like Rana, who was, you know, shot three times by Islamic State. Incidentally, they came into her tent to abduct her, all dressed as women. They were all mm. in the cab, but they were men. They took her away, held her within the camp for 10 days, tortured her with a cattle probe, then um, shot her. She was rescued by the Kurds, and now she's in this kind of protected annex. That there are a lot of people like that, even those still in the camp, mm. may have no vision of a life beyond the camp, whatever's happened to them in the camp. These places sound completely, I mean, com completely hellish. I, I, I want to ask you about something else in a minute, but before I do, what, what's it like reporting from them? How easily do you, can you have access to them? What kind of security do you need wandering around them? Um, it's not that difficult. You um, go into northern, northeastern Syria and you apply for permission to visit the camps and then... When that permission comes through a few days later, you go, you speak to the uh, camp administration. And if you want to go into one of the annexes, uh, you do need security. Mm -hmm. It's um, Most women won't want to speak to you. Uh, they won't want to speak to you as a foreigner. They won't want to speak to you as a journalist. Now, um, in case anything they say might compromise the case that they've got going on, um, in some areas they'll chuck stones at you or the kids will. Um, and... Uh, but in other areas, it's not. I mean, Rodge Camp, which is was always the kind of showcase camp. It was better run, had much smaller numbers than Al Hole. You're not terrified walking around it. I mean, it's all right. You can walk around. I only had uh, a couple of the, the staff with me there. They weren't armed. Um, and you're not... You know, it's not it's not the end of the world in there. It's not apocalyptic. Um, it's simmering tension. You don't want to walk around in our hole alone, that's right. for sure. But in Rog Camp, you kind of you can. But then you do get areas of the camp which, even in Rog, you wouldn't want to go to some of the areas. Mm. You've got you know kids who are now. 16, 15, 16, 17 years old, who are only, you know, 11, 12, 13, when the final battle against Islamic State was fought, who have now been radicalised, who are enforcing Islamic State edicts in some areas, even of Raj. Uh, and these, these, you know, these were tiny children or very small children, uh, 
when the last vestige of Islamic State was kind of obliterated, but they've grown up in the camps, radicalised. Not all of the children have, but some of them have. And yeah. that's inevitable. That's yeah. totally inevitable. Frightening places. Look, very briefly, before I, I, I let you go, you, you met again in Syria, someone who became a big story in 2020 after suffering horrific burns. Remind people about Mohammed Hamid and what happened to him and what's happened to him now. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was, this was um, a slightly more uplifting meeting. Mohammed Hamid, in fact, it was October 2019, he was terribly badly wounded. As a 13-year-old, he was a Syrian Kurdish kid who had been living in the town of Ras Alain. This was, if, if listeners can recall, it's the moment when Donald Trump, who was then president, had had a phone call pre with President Erdogan of Turkey, in which Trump said he was going to withdraw the majority of American soldiers from northeastern Syria, which he duly did. On the back of that, the Turks, who are, who are no friends at all of the Kurds in that area, launched a ground offensive into this town, Ras Alain, which they captured from the Kurds during the course of that battle. This, this boy, Mohammed Hamid, was terribly badly burned. He got 70% burns after being set aflame by some kind of incendiary device. And it's a bit unclear as to what it was, whether it was Turkish shell or whether it was some sort of incendiary mortar device fired by one of the Turkey, Turkish allies, the Free Syrian Army, who were operating there too. Anyway, he would surely have died. I happened to be in this field hospital when he was brought in. Um, a few hours after being burned, he was screaming in pain. And uh, I took a couple of photographs of him as he was being treated, once he being given morphine. He was then evacuated by Save the Children a couple of days later because he was, would surely have died if he'd remained. The um, Iraqi Kurds then, then over the border, then helped get him evacuated, but President Macron in, intervened to France and he was treated for several months in, in Paris's Mercy, Percy Military Hospital mm -hmm. before coming back. Now, it's ironic, I found him these years later, and he's kind of strong, handsome guy, now 17 years old. His burns for two years, he had to stay in the shadows and uh, having returned home and avoid school, he couldn't expose his burns to sunlight. But those days are, are gone now, have passed. He's at school, he's out in sunlight, he can walk around in sunlight again. And a really cool kid who kind of embodied the way that some kids, very resilient, can endure so mm -hmm. much, even in war. Uh, it is ironic, though, that, of course, during this time, the Turks were furious about images of this child burned in one of their attacks in 2019, had said that the photographs actually which I'd taken were staged and shot in a studio. And <clears throat> only a few months ago, when the Israeli oper operation started in Gaza, the photos I'd taken were actually republished online only with the kind of fake news tag that, in fact, this was a Palestinian mm. kid who had been burned by Israeli white phosphorus. So, in some ways, you know, the manipulation of truth around Mohammed yeah. Hamid's case continues. But the point is that here is a kid who was terribly badly burned, who survived against the odds and is doing his best in what well, is, 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 is a strong life he's having in Hasaka. And I was very happy to meet him get him again. Very cool kid. Nice to have a, an almost uplifting story. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony Lloyd. Always a pl massive pleasure. Um, and you can, read, uh, you can read Anthony in The Times with your digital subscription and check out his upcoming pieces from detention camps in Syria over the next week, of course, as well.